you know, whenever you talk about art, it's better to uh, you know present data uh, rather than in a sheet. Uh, it's better to present data in a in a in a in a visual as opposed to a sheet like this. So of course, you know, this data that you see right now is same as this data, but then the second one is obviously much better. You know, it conveys a much clearer picture as to what are the problem areas. You know, for instance, red that means you know, problem areas and green means you don't have to worry about it. So, so, um, so art actually helps you, you know, remember, it kindles your emotion and you know, it energizes, it has a design component. Um, and, and the visualizations, uh, you know, they, they, in a way, uh, they are a way to express art. And uh, uh, there is a professor uh, by name, Dr. Hadley Wickham. He recently moved from uh, uh, you know, being a professor to, I think, working full time at Art Studio, which is a company in California. Uh, they are releasing tools uh, uh, and packages for the art programming world, and they are sort of building a community to help people around the world to do uh, data inputting, data wrangling, and data visualizations. So uh, he said this that actually stuck with me. Uh, he said that visualizations, visualizations can surprise you. Um, what this really means is that, is that you know, unless you throw the data into a chart and then you see where something performs the best or performs the worst, until then, you know, there's no element of surprise uh, because the data is like buried somewhere in like a mountain of, uh, you know, Excel sheets or text files or web uh, PDF files, you know, whatever. Uh, you know, unless you visualize it, you know, there's no way to get surprised about it. I want to go, uh, you know, one, uh, one uh, step further um, and, and kind of take this to data, to visualizations, that will evoke an emotion and then that will push you to decisions and then to action. And this, I, would, I, I want to uh, say that this is the, the formula, if you will, to affect you know, action around the world. Because uh, you know, when you join a company or, or when you're you know, publishing a research paper or whether you're persuading somebody to do something, uh, you have to uh, present data to, to uh, affect uh, an action, right? But, but there's a series of steps you know, from data only if you present a, you know, a potentially powerful visualization, will the person who is listening on the other end uh, can really think about it and then be uh, moved by it for, in some way and then you know, like, make sure they can take a decision and then you know, that will pursue an action, right? Uh, so uh, I, I see uh, uh, some hands raised, but I'll let uh, you know, uh, uh, Surya, uh, you know, Talk about you know when to you know have an have an, an interruption and then try to answer any questions that they have. Um, so Surya, it's okay to move forward. Yeah, yeah. go move forward, uh, Anand. Okay, all right, sounds good. Uh, so data visualization, for instance, you know you can see that you know this particular red colored dot, for instance, the nine sector is still failing, and that will evoke an emotion, and maybe you're sad, and maybe you're angry that that sector is still failing, and that can you know. Uh, make sure we can you know, get to a decision and an action. For instance, you, know, you can allocate more budget or you can change leadership for that sector, stuff like that. So visualization to decision to action. And I'm going to you know, quickly run through some of the data visualization classics here and you can read a lot more, lot more about this. This is a, a campaign. This is a map of uh, Napoleon's uh, Russian campaign. Um, you can, uh, from the left to right, you know, how many troops went from one area to the other and how many returned back and this graph is pretty good because you know it contains several important parameters like troops, the distance, the temperature, latitude, longitude, the direction of travel, and there are many complex things in a particular uh, chart. And this is one of the classics of data visualization. This is an example of a complex chart. Now, with data visualization, there are actually two schools of thought. One is uh, you know representing a lot of information in one chart. That's one one school of thought. Uh, and another school of thought is to uh, focus on clarity in decision making. Now, you, both these are important. Uh, both these are useful in different contexts. Like, for example, if you're talking to a CEO uh, 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 who has maybe like 30 seconds or 45 seconds, where you have to present a, a powerful case and say, you know, is it A versus B versus C? Then you want to, you know, direct his attention to his or her attention to like one or, or two aspects of it. Whereas if you're doing an, an analyst kind of a role where you, know, you put up a chart and you, you learn a lot of stuff, you, you debate on certain aspects, then a complex chart like this will be very useful. Uh, let me give you another tip. Like for example, you can think of Apple or Google Maps. You know, Maps is a, you know, is a complex representation, right? You have buildings, you have roads, 
uh, you, you know, you have water bodies, you have you know, starting and ending points, you have, you have several things. But still, you know, maps give us a way to clearly identify where you are and then where you want to go and the shortest path towards it or, you know, multiple paths and the advantages and disadvantages of different paths, right? So the ability to zoom in and zoom out in a complex map is key to, you know, using um, a complex visualization to, to learn something and then make decisions and then move forward. Right? So, so that's this is an example of a complex map. And there's several other examples, you know, I'm going to quickly run through uh, these, but you know, these are uh, not, uh, just to give you a flavor of, uh, you know, uh, some classics in data visualization. Um, now, uh, this one is interesting. Maybe I'll spend a, a quick 20 seconds on this. So this, if you imagine the world to be like 100 people and over the last two centuries, you can actually see that you know, even though there's a lot of bad news around, uh, um, in general uh, in, the, in the news circles, you can see that extreme poverty, education, literacy, um, everything has uh, you know, improved over the last 200 years tremendously, right? Um, uh, it's still interesting to see that, you know, <laughs> Uh, there's, there's still 44% of the world is not in a democracy. That's uh, that's interesting. So there's some work, uh, um, you know, needed uh, there. Uh, you know, what methods? You know, that's a more political question. Uh, but the idea is, you know, a chart like this will show us uh, in one slide, you know, how much we have progressed, you know, uh, and this gives a much much clearer picture, you know, compared to reading uh, like a like two three page article. It, it, it clearly tells us, you know where we are and you know, you know, where we were, and where we are currently, and then also gives us some clues as to you know, where we want to go and, and you know, what kind of policy decisions to make you know, to move the graph one way or the other. Right? So that's an that's a example of a, a classic in data visualization. So where do you use visualizations? Uh, for instance, you know, if you want to do, uh, you know, draw the attention, you're, you're, you're um, traveling and, and you only have a, a quick 10 second window to, to capture the uh, Rider's attention, so quick 50 is the speed limit, clear, bold, and you can draw attention to something. For verification, this is a case where you know the monsoon, June to September is the, is the, is the monsoon season where the rainfall on the y-axis is like much higher compared to um, you know, all, others, all other seasons. Um, this is a chart that, uh, that I plotted in using, uh, using R programming. Um, likewise, you know, I, I did this using R programming. Uh, uh, if you want to you know, if you're interested in comparison, this in this case, you know, I'm comparing the the number of units produced, uh, you know, between different locations, colored by different locations, and the x-axis, you know, is the day of the week. So, for instance, you can see, hey, you know, for instance, why is you know, Delhi having an unusually large number of production on on Wednesday? Uh, maybe you know, it's surprising you surprise it's surprising the way that you know it is possible to push production up to that number, and why is why are the other days you know not producing the same? Effects, so you can learn something from this graph. Uh, this is called outlier-based learning. And, uh, only when we visualize, you know, we'll be able to get some uh, inspiration based on outliers, and then we can uh, make those changes in, in, in other areas. And for instance, improve the production in, in other locations and, and other days. You know, up to the up to the same number that the jelly on Wednesday produced. Or you know, it could be an outlier. You know, maybe somebody was uh, uh, doing something that they're not supposed to do, and then that's a uh, Data point has to be removed or dealt with, or somebody needs to be fired, or whatever. You know, um, this is possible only when you you know produce a chart like this and then understand what's going on in the raw data, as opposed to you know just trying to distribute the work to multiple people and then having a lot of stand-up meetings, wasting a lot of people's time. Whereas you know the the decision maker uh, has a chart in front of him or her like this. You know, it makes uh, the job of a lot of people a lot more easier. Uh, it improves the, the efficiency of uh, of industries, if you will. So, reference, you all know about the periodic table. You know, it's a fantastic example of uh, a reference for you know visualization of uh, the, the chemical elements. It represents a lot of things, right? In terms of how many electrons there are in, in the valence shell, you know, which ones are uh, uh, the noble gases, for instance, where the metals go. You know, the different kinds of series. You know, whether for instance, uh, carbon, silicon, germanium, tin, lead, or you know, used in the semiconductor world. Uh, many different things, uh, many different complex things are represented in this one particular chart. Fantastic example of uh, data visualization for you know for reference charts. Strategy, you know, uh, some of you might have seen this chart, especially if you are uh, electrical engineering uh, or um, or uh, ECE folks, strictly an ECE folks. This is a 
a mathematical chart which is uh, indispensable for wireless design engineers. The center represents uh, uh, 50 ohms and the left hand side represents the short circuit. Right hand side in the represents an, an, an open circuit and the whole RF and, and, and antenna designs are, are done based on a chart like this. Um, the, the top portion represents the inductive area and the bottom portion represents the capacitive area. And this whole play of electromagnetics is an exchange of uh, energy from the inductive to the capacitive area. Um, and we can go on and you know, talk a lot more about this. Uh, uh, but this is a fantastic uh, you know, data visualization tool uh, to understand you know, where we are when it comes to uh, RF design circuits and then where we want to go, which is typically the center of the chart, which, probably, which means that the, the wave is actually going in from one part of the circuit to another in a seamless fashion so with minimal uh, you know, power reflections. So that's a tool in wireless, uh, wireless systems design. Uh, you can plot network charts. Um, Evidence, you know, this is a typical example. I have code to show this, this is a pretty interesting real world example too. Like for instance, you know, if you, uh, you let's say uh, you want to manufacture um, 20 lakhs uh, or 20, maybe even more, maybe 50 lakhs number of small cables, the cables about Yale long, like let's say 10, 10, 10 centimeter long cables that you want to use somewhere in some mobile device. Uh, then how do you manufacture you know, 50, 50 lakhs of that such cables? You, know, you have, let's say, two vendors. Uh, you, you give them uh, a task of, let's say, okay, vendor A, you go ahead and manufacture you know, one lakh worth of cables. Vendor B, you go ahead and manufacture another one lakh. But, the, but what you can tell them is, um, well, you have to measure every single cable that you're, uh, that you're manufacturing, and then you have to report the exact length of that cable. So vendor A, for instance, can you know, measure and say, the first cable was nine point, 99, uh, you know, second one was 9.975. Vendor B can similarly come up with like a uh, specific lens. You know, if you ask for 10, you know, nobody will actually give the exact 10, right? Because there are process variations. Uh, but then if you don't have any data, you know, both parties will come and say, hey, you know, everything is fine. You know, it's 10 centimeters long, but then when you actually fit it in, into a mobile device, you know, maybe it's not fitting in correctly. You know, maybe it's a little bit longer. And there's no place to hold that because real estate is pretty expensive in a, in a mobile device, right? You know, you know if, your, if your cable is like knocking on the other side, you know, the battery won't fit in. You know, if the cable is a little bit longer, maybe you can, you can touch the antenna and, and pass some other uh, problems. Uh, the, ante the, the camera casing might not fit in inside the you know, mobile device. Who knows? Uh, the, the real estate is extremely expensive uh, inside uh, a, a mobile device. So it is important to, you know, for us to exactly know that the cable that's coming into the uh, mobile device is of the uh, length that is expected, you know, 10 centimeters long. So in this particular example, uh, uh, let's say I, uh, uh, this is a hypothetical example, but then vendor A comes up with one lakh measurements, vendor B comes up with another one lakh measurements, I plot them using histogram, and I see that vendor A, and vendor B, they are distributed differently. Uh, you can see that the, that the blue is actually much closer to the 10 centimeter line, but then the blue has a wider standard deviation. Uh, so maybe only a, a small uh, region in this, around this 10 centimeter is actually useful. So I can use that particular set of cables and then you know, send the rest of the, rest of the cables out for, uh, you, know, you can reject the rest of the cables in, in vendor B. Whereas in vendor A, you cannot use any of the cables that they sent because maybe you know, it's like, it is, it is much lower than what is expected. However, vendor A, you can see that they have you know, much uh, tighter distribution, which means their process is much more well managed. So maybe you can talk to the vendor A, you can you know, understand what their process is, you know, make them shift their uh, overall distribution towards the right. Maybe that's like one small tweak, and maybe that's, it's, it's good to keep vendor A for the longer term. But for right now, you know, if you want to, a bunch of cables, you know, you can select a small bin uh, in vendor B and then use that. And then also maybe give a vendor B an ultimate, okay, you know, your process is not, uh, you know, tight, you know, it's not uh, quite repeatable. If I, if I ask you to manufacture 10 centimeter, some of uh, your cable is like, you know, 9.1, which is not acceptable. Uh, you need to have a much tighter distribution. So for instance, this is an example, this is a classic example of you need evidence, you need evidence to present to your management, uh, especially when you guys take up a job, you know, you can persuasively argue 
that uh, we have to right now go with temporarily go with a, a small bin within the vendor B, but then we have to also keep engaging vendor A because you know they have a much better process. Without this chart, everybody will claim to be you know ten centimeters, and then you know you'll you'll know only after the fact, after fitting into the product, for instance, that there is a problem. Right? This is a way to present evidence proactively so that you know your your process is optimized and you are able to solve engineering problems. Right? This is a classic. Uh, you know, this is a pretty good example of where data visualization can be useful. Debugging evidence. You know, uh, in the absence of the of the yellow dots that you see. The, the model lines or the approximate lines are going to be approximately the same. It's all it look like linear, but this, is, this uh, says that you know, in, addition to the, um, in addition to the data points, you have, in addition to the statistics, we have to look at the raw data. Only when you look at the raw data, you get a good understanding uh, of you know, where uh, your, uh, you know, your claims lie. You know, if somebody says, uh, hey, you know, in Y4, for instance, if somebody says, uh, if you don't take into account that one particular outlier that's here, um, uh, other if, if you there's no outlier like this, then the data distribution looks completely different, right? So you might come to wrong conclusions. So, so this is a uh, a case for debunking evidence by using data visualization. And then science, you know, what is science? Science has you know theory and experiments, right? But we've all been conditioned to think, especially you know in, in colleges, that you know theory drives experiment, and that's you know that's true to an extent, but then uh, but then it has some problems. So for instance, let's see your academia, for example, says, hey, do the experiment, and then you verify that the results match the theory, right? Um, in, in business, uh, people always say, hey, this is how we have always been doing stuff, um, uh, and so let's continue to do that. Thing, right? uh, but if you look at what the scientific method is, the scientific method uh, is based on a, a series of steps where you start from an initial hypothesis, you do an experiment, you do have some inference, then you formulate the theory and you validate the theory. This is the scientific process, this is called the scientific method. Uh, so in reality, the experiment actually drives theory. Uh, that's how you know, theories have been formed. When people observe something and then they formulate theory on, you know, based on that. So the mindset change is needed. You know, we've got to get back to you know, what the roots of uh, you know, science is, which is you know, experiment you know, drives theory. So the next generation academia and the next generation businesses should do something like this, you know, uh, well, this experimental data shows that, you know, this is where, you know, your theory fails. And so, you know, you need some you know, modifications to this particular theory. And then the, you know, the next generation business, for instance, uh, you need to collect data and then you plot the data and then you show, for instance, okay, here's where you can do uh, some improvements because, you, you know, your sales can improve, you do this, you know, stuff like that. So data, there is a there is a huge uh, difference between supply and demand when it comes to the number of employers that say that they need data visualization skills versus the number of students that uh, you know currently uh, uh, the schools are the schools and colleges are producing. So it's going to be a huge challenge, you know, coming up with efficient you know data science engineers to solve uh, you know world's problems. Um, so data visualizations, emotions, decisions, and actions, and then data therefore drives actions. And then, how can data science help you know um, help professionals? Uh, this is a fairly important chart. You know, um, I, I want you all to you know remember this. Um, so when I was growing up, uh, you know, I was always uh, told uh, it's, it's it's fairly common knowledge that you know you need to have depth in one particular area. Like for instance, if you see the T model, that's like one domain speciality, and then a breadth of knowledge in a few other things. So that's the T model. Now the world is moving more and more from a T model to a Pi model, where you need to have your domain speciality, whatever is your uh, area, mechanical engineering, or civil engineering, or, or electronics, or finance, uh, or even an artist, or marketing, whatever it is. But then you also need to understand the data that is there in your domain. So if you have the expertise to understand and plot, um, and slice and chop, and look at the data from multiple angles, uh, build models, you know, uh, or try to get data science as it relates to your domain speciality. Then you become become a Pi type researcher, and those types of researchers are like much much more valuable even today and uh, uh, you know tomorrow and, and the next 10, 20 years when, when the world is moving you know uh, at a rapid rate, generating a ton of data using different sources like right? the IoT data, you know, web data, 
this video data. There's like tons of data coming in from all areas and we need engineers uh, who have both domain speciality and the stats and computing knowledge that comes from uh, you know, taking a data science course. So if you're in the mid-career, for example, uh, you know, all companies are collecting data and a lot of companies struggle with representing the data. You know, um, they, they need to make decisions, you know, A versus B. Uh, you know, how do you make those, make those decisions? Uh, so this, uh, this uh, area of data science is actually applicable across, across the domains if you learn uh, uh, such a course. So if, you, uh, if you're running a company, you, know, you need to be worried about uh, data collection, data visualization, data cleaning, importing, your templates, lots of these things. Uh, and then let's say you're interested in higher studies and you're, you're finishing your college. This is very relevant to you guys because you, know, you might be writing research papers, journal papers, you're doing conference presentations. Uh, if you're applying for a you know, master's program either within India or uh, abroad, you will need to have uh, most likely part-time jobs or, or research assistantships and teaching assistantships to support yourself while you're studying. And uh, it is increasingly uh, 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 clear that the data science skills are in high demand because think of it from the from professor's side, right? The professor is getting a grant from either the industry or the government uh, or a consortium of uh, uh, other places where uh, they design an experiment, you know, they, they, fund, they collect a bunch of data, and then they need graduate students to analyze the data, right? So think of uh, yourself as a, as a, for instance, you know, a, a student with uh, knowledge about metallurgy, for example, and then another student with the knowledge about metallurgy plus data science skills, right? So clearly, you know, you can see that uh, the value of the person with the data science skills is much, much higher uh, when it comes to acquiring a, a research or teaching assistantship uh, when you go for higher studies, right? And then eventually, you know, when you become a, a much more important person in your career, you start your own company or you, you take up a position as a CEO or a CIO or, or COO of a company, you need to have dashboards. You need to understand uh, how to build those dashboards, how to affect decisions without your, uh, you know, without the help of a lot of uh, subordinates who might take you for a ride if you don't really understand how to do things for yourself. It's like building a restaurant, for instance, you know, if you are running a restaurant and if you know all the aspects of, uh, you know, how to manage a restaurant down to the level of making the particular pizza, for instance, then you're not dependent on anyone. It's not that you have to do it every day, but you must be able to do it if nobody else is, is, is there to, uh, uh, you know, uh, actually do it, do it for you. Plus it, it motivates, uh, you know, your employees, you know, hey, the people at the higher level, they actually know how to plot it. They, need to, they understand where the problem area is. So you can quickly jump in and then provide solutions. Right? So cross-validation, your design science, your dashboards. In several areas, this data science skills are going to be useful. So storytelling, you know, from problem to solution using this method of data visualizations, emotions, and decisions and actions. Um, and then the, so how do you plot a graph? You know, there are two aspects of plotting a graph. Uh, one is called aesthetics, the other is called geoms. And aesthetics deals with you know, what goes in the x-axis, what goes in the y-axis, your shape, your color, and, and all those uh, you know, aspects of that increase the aesthetic value of a graph. Those are called aesthetics. And then geoms basically are uh, elements of geometry, of points, lines, and polygons. Together, uh, with a good design is what makes a good chart. Right? So uh, in, uh, take this uh, you know, class, uh, you know, a, an excellent example of uh, what uh, uh, a good visualization can provide. So for example, here, let's say I've plotted um, uh, the, the quality metric of, of a production system on, let's say, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Wednesday in red, Thursday in green, and uh, Friday in blue. You can derive a lot of uh, uh, things from this particular chart. For example, you can actually see the trend. That's, you know, it's, it's the, the production quality metric is actually going down from Wednesday to Thursday to Friday. You can, for instance, uh, see that this outlier on Wednesday here is, um, is uh, you know, we can understand whether this is a good outlier or a bad outlier. If it's a bad outlier, um, then it's got to be removed. If it's a good outlier, a good outlier is something that's supposed to be in the data point. A bad outlier is, is for instance, it was there by mistake. You know, for example, if you're taking data from, uh, from the bones and if there's a muscle there, you know, that's a bad outlier. It's got to be, it's, it's not supposed to be in the, in the data. Um, if it's a good outlier, then how do you derive inspiration and then make sure that the whole, uh, you know, uh, Thursday and Friday data is moved up to the you know, Wednesday, 
good outlier data. That's that's an inspiration. The process change that you can do. Uh, you can, uh, for instance, look at the underperforming ones. On let's say, on if you look at the bottom right, there are two data points that are underperforming. So you can take decisions on whether they need more training or whether people need to be fired, whatever. And then you also see the statistics on top of it. Uh, you can see the big circle uh, on that's the average of Wednesday, and then you can see the average of Thursday and average of Friday. You can actually make modifications based on the measures of central tendency. That's the the big circle uh, in between uh, and, make the, and make qualitative comparisons between Wednesday and Thursday. In the absence of a plot, you know, for instance, people can take individual data points and then argue that one is better than the other. For example, the highest data point on Friday and the lowest data point on Thursday you know, are, are lopsided, right? Like for example, the person who's responsible for Friday will highlight only the biggest data point. And the person who's responsible for, um, uh, and, and you know, try to say, you know, Friday is actually better than Thursday. In the lack of a good visual like this, you know, it's anybody's game. You know, people get you know highlight like individual data points and then argue one versus the other. So when you are arguing across groups, you should always argue based on measures of central tendency. That's either the mean or you know how is the distribution of one day's data how does it compare to the distribution of a different different day's data. Uh, so this is a classic for uh, you know categorical comparison. Um, Anand, any, any questions on this? Yes, Anand. So there are there are three questions. So the first question is from Shivam. Uh, how da data visualization is related to R programming? Uh, yeah, that's that's an excellent question. So uh, I'm going to get to that in the next ten minutes because this is all um, uh, all these charts that you are that that you are that you have seen so far. Like 70, 80 percent of them, what I've showed you are the charts that I created using R programming. Okay. So, um, so by so R is a programming language. So using R, you can actually take data from a CSV file or an Excel file or a text file, uh, and then you can clean up the data and then present the data in powerful moving ways to affect decision, uh, like the charts that I showed you. That's the answer to the question: uh, data visualization versus R programming. R programming is the tool that you use to do these data visualizations. Great, thanks, Anand. Uh, there's another question from uh, Neha and Rice. Uh, uh, Rice wanted to ask anything specifically related to college students and how to learn R programming for them. Yeah. So, uh, so for college students, you know, if you are learning R programming, it gives you an early head start on your career. You can do your assignments using R. You can create conference papers and journal presentations using R. You can do what's called reproducible research using R. You can use those R programming skills when you apply for uh, uh, you know, a job as an, as an entry level uh, analyst, for example, or if you're doing higher studies, you know, there are increased chances of uh, getting assistantships. Uh, if you are trained in a, in a data science program, um, you will uh, most likely keep using this R programming throughout your career uh, in order to produce good charts, you know, no matter which area you're going, even if you're becoming a journalist you know, out of the blue. Uh, an article with an excellent chart next to it is much more powerful than an article without a chart. Um, uh, so uh, for college students, uh, getting a head start on you know, learning R programming, which is uh, the cost, uh, because the software itself is free. So uh, the cost is only in, in investing in yourself or uh, paying for the actual training. Um, so, uh, so that way, you know, I wish I learned the R programming when I was in, in, in college. But especially, this is a good time to learn R programming, mainly because over the last three, four years, um, there has been tremendous amount of development uh, in the R programming world, and there's a fantastic uh, you know, community that's come together uh, and provided tools that is called uh, Tidyverse and the pipeline programming methods using R that I'm going to be teaching later on in this, in this course. Um, uh, that lends itself to a, a very uh, easy, uh, method of learning R using data pipes. Uh, this is what I'm going to be, you know, covering over the, over the course. So it's 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 an excellent opportunity for uh, college students to get started earlier. Oh, okay, thank you, Anand. Uh, uh, there are there are a lot more questions uh, coming in. So or, or? I'll take two more questions. Um, okay. uh, how is data visualization different from data analytics and data mining? Uh, this that's also. 
a useful question. So data and data analysis is pretty, uh, it's a general term. And data mining is usually used in a term where you know, people actually know nothing about the data that's like you normal know, people. The data is like hidden somewhere deep and there is no way to clearly say you know, what is there and what's not there in the data. Then people use the term data mining. But the idea whether it's data mining or data analysis is to get a good handle on what are the variables that are present in the data. What are the terms of uh, figure of merit that a company or a person is interested in, in, in deducing from the data. For example, if you have data from uh, you know, uh, all the inventory of a, uh, of a particular company and the, the manufacture, manufacturing uh, quality of, uh, uh, or, or rather the, the inventory, the expenses, uh, the income, and let, maybe at the end of, uh, end of the day, uh, every month, you know, a report needs to be created and, and, and uh, the company CEO is interested to understand where the money goes and you know, which division performs the best. Those kinds of tools, if all the data is like hidden somewhere in a database, it needs to be mined, the data uh, you can use tools to take the data, bring it into our programming. Uh, then you can uh, you know, wrangle the data, like filter it by, uh, filter it, group it, and then you visualize it. And then the visualized graph with the, accompanied by an article is what the report means, right? That's what needs to be presented to the CEO. So to answer the question, Data mining and data analysis, uh, sometimes they are used interchangeably. And data visualization is like one aspect of data analysis where when you plot the data, you can see that there are groups within the data. For instance, if I did not plot the data with X, like in the given chart in front of you, if I did not plot day in the X-axis and the quality meter in the Y-axis, it's just a bunch of data points without any color or axis, right? These aesthetics and the geoms they give us a good picture of trying to understand and make sense out of what the data is. It gives us good insight into what happened in the data. Um, that is what data visualization gives. And in a, in a way, that's the same as data analysis. So data analysis is a more generic term. Data mining is a term that is used to bring in data that is hidden deep into, uh, for instance, the web or, or databases or like hundreds of thousands of text files. People call it, typically call it data mining. Um, but in, in the end, you know, they're all, uh, there's a common theme in, in between all these, which is there's data somewhere, you have to import it, you have to wrangle it, you have to visualize it, and you have to analyze and make decisions. That's the common theme that runs through all these challenges. And that happens across domains. It happens in academia, in industry, across domains. So the, the advantage of learning that is it is domain agnostic. It can be used in uh, any uh, uh, future career changes that you have. Uh, this this skill will actually follow you to that particular uh, domain that you're interested in. You're, if you're doing uh, engineering and then finishing and doing MBA, um, you know it'll be useful there. You know, if you're doing an MS, it'll be useful there. If you're taking up a job, it's going to be useful there. Okay, great. Um, can you take one more question, Anand? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so actually, there are two more, uh, but uh, there are a lot, a uh, lot of questions. Uh, I'll just have one thing. Um, one thing is, Himanshu asks, does cleaning the data require feature engineering or other tools? Uh, or are there tools for data cleaning? So that is one question. And uh, um, Morley asks, uh, how to convert categorical variable into numerical variable? So these are two questions. Well, so, yeah, uh, we, can talk, you know, we can talk more about it. Uh, I think, so I'll give you just a flavor of uh, you know, answers for this. These are like very specific questions that are inside programming. Uh, so we may not have time to go into that. But the idea is there are like several packages that people inside the R community have written and who have uploaded for, and it's free for everybody else to use. So for instance, uh, you know, there is a package called Janitor. You download the package and there, is a, uh, there are functions within that package uh, that clean up the names and make your variable names pretty clean. Otherwise, you know, your raw data can be pretty messy. Uh, there is a package called visdat, D-I-S underscore D-A-T. Uh, where you can visualize the missing values. You can, uh, you can then deal with you know, missing data, for instance, you know, whether you need to replace that with some average data in the surrounding points. When to use that is a, is a domain challenge. For example, if you, the data of a state Gujarat is missing, you cannot uh, you know, average the data of the states around them and then make that to be Gujarat. For instance, uh, if the data of like, uh, like one uh, particular day, attendance day of one person is missing, but he is consistently you know, uh, performed uh, and you know, attended the school for a, 
So a long time, maybe it's good to take a moving average of the last you know five data data points around that, and then fill up the missing, missing data. So so to answer, those are like very specific questions, and the generic answer is there are packages to deal with uh, you know specific questions that are programming challenges that, that come in, and that our programming is, is good at solving those things, which we will cover as part of the uh, of, of the course itself. Thanks, Anand. Uh... Yeah, uh, I think you can move forward. We will, uh, let me move forward because there's, yeah. a, there's a lot to cover and to give a flavor of you know uh, what's important and what's uh, going to be covered in the in the, in the course. Uh, so let me move on in the interest of time. Um, so so the question is, it actually uh, you know goes well into where to start. You know, a lot of people uh, you know understand that this is important, but they don't know where to start, right? So our programming is an excellent place to start. Uh, R is a free and open source tool. Uh, R can, um, uh, uh, so you download R and you download R Studio, which is an IDE that sits on top of R, and then you start doing programming using R. Um, this particular uh, slide that I uh, showed you, which, uh, which is the vendor A versus vendor B, you can see that on the left-hand side, you know, the total number of uh, code, lines of code is actually pretty minimal that comes from the raw data. Unit. And then you can also see that, for instance, line number five is I take a CSV file, I I use a symbol called pipe, you know, percentage greater than percentage, it's called data pipe. You take a raw data, you pipe it into a function called read CSV, you further do a gather command, which is a data reshaping command, and then you do separate, which actually uh, is another uh, data wrangling command. Basically, the idea is to uh, shape your data, clean up certain things, make sure your data becomes tidy, and there is a formal definition of what is called a tidy data, which you'll see in the course. And then once your data is tidy, you can further pipe it into a ggplot and do two things, aesthetics and geoms. You can see that aesthetics goes, with, okay, what are you going to plot? You know, what are you going to give the color for? And a geom, in this case, is a histogram. And I also do an extra geom, which is a vertical line that says where exactly I want the limit data to be. In my case, you know, 10 centimeter long tables. And then I add some, uh, you know, labels, and then I produce a pretty good chart. Record. So the idea is, with very few lines of code, with the pipeline the programming concepts in R, and with the excellent tidyverse community support. When I say library tidyverse, it brings in a whole set of R packages that other people have written uh, into, your, uh, uh, into your programming environment, and you can use several of the functions. For instance, read underscore CSV comes from a package which is called as part of the tidyverse. So tidyverse is essentially a universe of packages that helps you do this data analysis and data visualization. So I'm going to you know, quickly run through some examples and then I'm going to give you a demo. Okay? So some uh, ask you examples, you know, when do you use one variable? Uh, so uh, uh, if it's a numeric, you use a histogram. Uh, so this is, these are examples of histograms and how you change the bin width in order to understand certain things. I'm, I'm just going to move for, you know, fast on this uh, because it's, uh, there's a lot to cover and these are like very specific instances which you learn as part of the course. Uh, categorical example, whenever there's a categorical example, you can uh, you know, plot a, what's called a bar chart. You know, in this case, you know, investment count versus uh, uh, an account on the y-axis and the investment on the x-axis. You know, it shows the relative size of one versus the other. If there are two variables, both are numeric, then you use what's called a scatter plot. Uh, in this case, salaries in the y-axis and the experience is, is in the x-axis. Uh, if you have uh, two variables, uh, one is categorical, the other is numerical, then you can use a box plot. Uh, and the other one is also an example of a box plot where in the x-axis you have a categorical variable, um, which is the type of uh, uh, you know, car that you are interested in. The y-axis is the, is the mileage the car gives, you know, how many miles per, uh, uh, per, uh, per gallon. Uh, it's, a, it's a unit of volume of fuel. Uh, for instance, you can see that the SUV is, has low mileage, whereas the compact car has a you know, much higher mileage. And then you can learn, a, learn about a lot of technical terms, like you know, what does the center line mean? What, are, what is the meaning of this box? Uh, there's something called interquartile interval, the, you know, what is the meaning of outlier. These are all you know, basic statistics, which are pretty important no matter what you do. You know, at one point I was thinking that statistics is not important for, for engineers. Uh, but to be honest, I realized for the average engineer, statistics is actually way more important than calculus. <laughs> um, of course, you know, calculus is, is a very important thing if you want to you know, advance the field uh, from uh, the, the known to the unknown elements. Uh, uh, but you know, statistics is pretty important. So understanding mean, median, what are the outliers, what is the range, able, the ability to group uh, data and then plot it into different uh, 
you know, types of charts and then make meaningful set sense out of these uh, different plots is an excellent skill to have for students. The three variables, you know, for example, you can have x-axis and y-axis, you can have color, you know, in this particular example, uh, the red, um, you know, basically means whether the person owns a home or not. And you can actually see that, uh, uh, for example, there's one, one person with like four years of experience and uh, the salaries in the 30 plus lakhs is probably CEO of the company. Um, this chart actually tells a lot. And if this data is like hidden inside a, a text file or, a, or an Excel file, there's not much you can say out of that chart. Whereas you can see, um, uh, by the way, you know, you can, uh, you can see me move the cursor, right? Can you? Yes, yes. Uh, okay. Okay. So, uh, so if you, if you follow the cursor, you know, this is a simple chart with the, uh, uh, with uh, experience in the x-axis and salary in the y-axis, but you can actually see that, you know, this guy on, on the right, uh, is probably the CEO of the company learns a lot, has a lot of experience. Uh, you can actually see that, uh, um, uh, for, for instance, these people here have a lot of experience, but still they are paid very less. They're probably laggards. They, they don't perform very well in the, in the company. And then there's this one guy who has like less than um, one year of experience, just a few months of experience and is already paid close to 20 lakhs. It's probably a, an overachiever and so are these guys. And then this whole range, they, they form the engine of the company. Whereas, you know, these, prob these people are probably managers and they actually distribute the work to you know, subordinates and further, uh, you know, maybe these guys are interns. So you can actually see a, a simple visualization like this is able to point out a lot of details about, you know, uh, the, the employees of the company, right? Um, so uh, that's like this, this chart is actually done in our programming. And then if you're, if you're uh, printing it in a, uh, in, a, in a paper, you know, maybe you can use shapes instead of colors, you know, um, then you can do something called facets, you know, all the folks who are owning a home on the left hand side and who are renting on the right hand side. I just pushed this to the limit and I saw whether you know, an eight variable plot can be represented in a, in a, in a, in a given chart. Uh, if, this, if this is the raw data of a, of a company that is a, a sporting app development company, um, you know, the name, gender experience, and you know, where they're located, what salary they're learning, whether they are willing to travel and what sport they're interested. This is a chart that has like eight variables represented. It has the x-axis, y-axis. Uh, it has whether the uh, you know person uh, you know, is a consultant or a manager or an engineer, and whether they're willing to travel and you know, uh, you know what uh, um, what what sport they like. And for instance, a chart like this can be displayed in a meeting table, uh, and then decisions can be taken based on let's say there's an up upcoming conference and a cricket conference, and uh, who do you need to send? And the conference is happening in India. And it's got to be at least one engineer to demo the app. You can like narrow it and then see, okay, it doesn't make sense to send somebody who's in Switzerland. Uh, so the, the location is based on the different color. The size represents the experience. The shape represents whether the uh, person is male or female. So you can, you know, come up with, uh, okay, you know, maybe this person called Sachin, you know, who's, a, who's an engineer who's willing to travel, who's interested in cricket. Yeah, sure, you know, why not send him to you know, demo the uh, the app in front of uh, you know, folks in the conference. So, uh, so rather than you know deferring decisions by you know asking subordinates to come up with uh, meaningful uh, decisions, a chart like, like this, even though it has like eight, nine, eight variables, you know, it, all, it packages all these things together and, and helps analyze the problem at hand and, and, and come up with solutions faster. And then there are, you will learn more about this in the course. You know, there's this concept called over plotting where, you know, instead of plotting like this, you can plot like this by using what's called jittering, you know, to just uh, uh, move around the, the data points a little bit so that it's a better effect in your plot. Uh, and then you'll, these are some case studies, uh, accident trends. Um, uh, and then this is another method. I plotted the uh, states on the y-axis and the, and the accident count on the x-axis. And this is a chart which is not ordered. Therefore, you know, it's only limited to its use. Whereas the same chart, if I order it, you can see, for instance, the Tamil Nadu has the maximum number of accidents followed by Maharashtra and Karnataka. Uh, so maybe, you know, a chart like this is useful to you know, allocate resources, for example. And I used coordinate flipping. You know, you learn about all these terms on, you know, how to make your plot a good plot that is, uh, you know, publication worthy people. Uh, or you know, just for your own sake to you know to share uh, share it with your peers, uh, or to advance you know yourself in your career. The chart like this would be useful. And then uh, and then there's a there's a case study which is based on the IPL final that I'm going to um, you know go uh, do as a demo. So I'm going to skip this here. 
so this is a, a, a chart that I did. Just, I'll just look, give you 30 seconds to look at this particular chart uh, where I took the raw data from uh, this website uh, or so Twitter handle called uh, Cricksheet. And then I took the ball by ball data and then in the bottom I plotted it you know, on an overall overwise, the, the worm charts. And then this is uh, uh, the overwise uh, uh, data. So the bottom is, is the innings wise, the middle one is the overwise and then the top one is like ball wise. And then there's a lot more to it. Like if you zoom in and you can see that there are extras here and maybe a wicket fell down here. A graph like this would be useful for uh, coaches, for example, to see, hey, you know, how come Mumbai Indians, uh, if, you know, four runs in this particular sixth over. What made Mumbai Indians win by just one run in the, the past IPL final? So this is all done from scratch using our programming, which is what the demo that I'm going to give in the last few minutes. Um, and then there are other case studies. This is this example that we saw. Uh, and then another case study about rainfall. And uh, I'm going to show you a, a cool plot. Like this is a plot called a ridge plot. You can see that the rainfall in the month of July is, uh, you know, is much, much larger than the rainfall in the, other other months. Um, so um, uh -huh. I think I'm going to uh, quickly jump to uh, well. There are some summary tips. Uh, you know, what do you do when you do simple plot versus complex plot? How do you you know deal with the raw data and clean up the names? What is the meaning of data reshaping? Why do you need uh, you know a long data versus a wide data? For instance, you learn techniques like white data is best for for computers, and long data is, sorry, white data is best for human beings to understand, whereas long data is good for computers to understand. How do you handle missing values, the data wrangling, all these you learn in the, in the course. And then what do you do to enhance your, your visualization? How do you use colors and shapes and minimize white spaces and reordering, data jittering, themes and coordinate flipping? When do you use what kind of a chart? Um, uh, and, and lots of things like this. So let me move to a, a quick demo and then we'll come back to this. Uh, is that uh, fine, Surya? Yeah, 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 go ahead, Anand. Okay, so uh, I'm going to show you, uh, actually I'm going to uh, show you uh, one quick example in this, which I think is, uh, let me see. If, uh, uh, let me show you, I guess this one. Okay, so this is a, a screen. Uh, excuse me, you, you, are, uh, you are able to see my R Studio, Studio screen, is that right? Yes, yes, Anand. Okay. okay, so this is the R Studio environment, which is, which is what we use to uh, program using R. Um, and I, I'm, uh, I'm going to show you uh, two R scripts. Um, the first R script, I'm going to show you uh, this production data. So I'm going to uh, run this particular command, and on the right hand side, you'll actually uh, so I think first we need to run these housekeeping things. Uh, I'm running this and then I'm showing a, a graph like this. You see a graph on the on the right here. Uh, if I zoom in, you'll actually are you seeing this graph? Zoom one. Yeah. Uh, so we are we are seeing a graph on your uh, right hand on side. Right. Yeah. Okay. How about now? Yes. Okay. you are seeing this, right? Yep. So this is so. If you look at the uh, you know the the code on the on the on the left hand side. And I'm taking the production data. I'm piping it to a CSV file. I'm gathering certain things. Then I say mutate. I create an extra column, and then I pipe it into ggplot, and then I I do some uh, extra labels, and then I get a nice chart like this, right? And I'll show you another. Uh, so uh, this is the cable vendor data. I'll, I'll quickly run that. Uh, so I'm doing a live demo here where I come up with that particular you know, cable uh, vendor example that I showed you. It's just a few lines of code. Uh, and then for students, you know, this is much, probably much, you can relate this to, uh, you can relate more to this graph. You know, let's say uh, there's a physics experiment and, the, and, the, and your uh, teacher asks you, professor asks you to create or measure the acceleration due to gravity. Um, and then uh, the raw data, if you look at the raw data, it's just a few, like a set of data points, right? Student D came up with this value, A came up with this value. But now, you know, you're plotting it in such a way that you are uh, you're plotting the actual expected value. You're plotting who came close to that particular value. Um, you are also dealing with the things like, you know, somebody, most of them overestimated it, whereas like one person underestimated it. Uh, so the ability to make a plot like this as opposed to just having a, the raw data is, 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 is useful. Let me go to the, the IPL because that's actually much more uh, interesting and uh, you know, it has a lot more details to it. So, uh, 
what I'm doing here in the IPL data set is uh, in almost all data science projects, you have like five key things. Um, those, those, things are, uh, so, uh, those things are written here. Uh, it's first one is housekeeping. Second one is data importing. Third one is data wrangling. Fourth one is data visualization and data presentation. These form the basics. And once you understand these things, you can move further into data modeling and machine learning. Uh, oftentimes in machine learning, you use the buzzword, but then uh, understanding these basic parameters of importing, wrangling, and visualization is key before moving on to the pipeline the method of uh, approach where you can do modeling and, and machine learning. So I'm going to just focus on, on housekeeping, data importing, wrangling, visualization, and presentation uh, in, the, in the program. Uh, and I'm going to show you an example using the scripted data set. Housekeeping, I'm running it in front of you right now. It's clearing up all the chart, you know, clear, clearing up all the variables here, uh, setting your working directory, you know, loading some packages, and then I'm importing the raw data into, into the R program. And now I have R, uh, you know, uh, raw data here. Once I have raw data, I, I do some manipulations. Actually, let me show you uh, how the raw data looks like a little bit here, so you get a flavor of you know, what, I'm, uh, what I'm talking about. Um, just hang with me for one second here. Uh, so the raw data looks looks like this. I opened up the raw data and I'll share that uh, that screen with you. Uh, yeah, this is how the raw data looks like. The raw data looks like hey, uh, you know, there's some metadata on the top. Mumbai Indians versus Pune. Uh, who you know when was the match conducted and all those details. So when I import this data, you know, I need the data from this particular, you know, uh, row number 20. And then I need things like, uh, uh, okay, this column, H represents the column of the, you know, runs off of the bat. And then the next column is the column, this extras columns. I need to add those two to get the total number of runs. Then I need to do some wrangling operations. Like for example, 1.2 basically represents the second over, second ball. So I need to separate that 1.2 into one and two and then add one to this one because 1 1.2 is the second over. So I need to do some you know, minor manipulations like this, uh, which is uh, what I'm doing in the code. If you look at the code, uh, let me go back to the code here. So raw data, I filter by wherever the ball is, then I separate from over to ball, then I, I add the two runs, then I mutate and do over is over plus one. All this, the important thing, you don't need to understand all the details, but the thing to notice, it is, packaged into five different uh, sets, all data science projects are, and they are not as difficult as, as people think. You take the raw data and then save it as a raw data, as in raw data and the CSV file is now inside the environment. You pipe it into a set, set of you know, functions that is under your, uh, uh, your toolkit, and then you, you save it as a tidy data that includes you know, things like grouping and mutating, and lots of other uh, nice, nice features. From there, you plot it into ggplot with proper aesthetics and geoms, and then you do a lot of theme customizations. And you, you know, in the course of uh, taking this course, you'll actually understand how to you know, intelligently use the themes and the, and the geoms uh, in a fashion that uh, you know, gets you these uh, excellent charts. And then how do you, in the final step, you know, take this particular chart and then uh, for, you know, create a PDF out of it. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to select everything and then run it. Um, so I'm running this in front of you, and uh, and, and it's, it's creating a set of charts. Uh, then I'll show you what the final chart looks like. Okay, the final PDF is created. This got created. So let me go ahead and, and, uh, and uh, switch to that particular screen which is uh, here. So you can see that, you know, IPL plot, final plot is just created right now, 5.03 PM. And I'm double clicking that. And now I have to, um, I'll change to that uh, PDF string. Yeah, this is the PDF plot. So you can see that this plot has just got created, like, uh, and you can you can zoom in and see you know lots of details uh, and, this is, and using you can adjust the PDF ratio and you can you know blow up the chart into a very big chart too because it's all vector vector images so you can create infographics you can create very very meaningful charts by getting a good handle on what geom to put and what aesthetics to put 
Uh, as you can see, you know, if you zoom out and see overall features, how you know Mumbai Indians, uh, I mean, Pune had a much better hand in the initial, but they failed to capitalize in the, in the final over. Uh, whereas Mumbai Indians, you know, had some pretty good, uh, you know, sixth over and uh, you know, in bits and pieces they hit some very pretty good runs, and then they somehow managed to beat uh, uh, Pune. And then uh, it's uh, it's a good uh, it's a good visual tool for analysis later on and understand. Like for instance. Uh, this over over number thirteen, right? Look how low the uh, RPS scored. You know they could have scored a little bit more in that particular over, and there's no particular reason, you know, why you know they were not doing that. Uh, so a, a chart like this can be used for uh, you know analysis, and you know be used in sports journalism, for instance. Uh, and this is only like one generic representation, right? You have the raw data. The same kind of raw data is going to be available in a different domain in a completely different aspect. But as long as you know those tools. Housekeeping, importing, data wrangling, and visualization and presentation, you'll be able to make meaningful sense out of your own domain data that will make you a Y kind of an expert as opposed to a T kind of expert. So I'm going to this chart. I think I'll probably you know uh, stop here and uh, you know if you have uh, any, I'll go back to the, the keynote and then if you have any questions, we can uh, you know address address there. But I'll leave you with this particular uh, slide. Um, uh, uh, over to you, uh, Surya. Yeah. So, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. So, uh, so guys, uh, so uh, thanks a lot, Anand. Uh, I I personally learned a lot from this uh, one-hour webinar. It was really interesting to see uh, the particular examples that you showed uh, about uh, uh, the IPL finals on how how close they were and uh, uh, understanding this is what uh, happens when in cricket matches they show all these graphs probably. This, this is what happens in the background. That's that's yeah. really <laughs> as well. Absolutely, um, yeah. And to see what, the applications of how different companies use uh, these kind of applications, uh, like yeah. R programming, to kind of showcase really understandable uh, things. So that's really helpful. Uh, so to folks, yeah. um, to folks in the line who have uh, are participated in our uh, in our. Um, Webinar. Thanks a lot for taking time. Uh, we will take some questions. Uh, if you have any particular questions, let us know now. Uh, we'll have five to ten minutes for questions, and uh, I'll uh, speak about how to get certificates for this uh, webinar after those questions. If you have any questions, we can uh, uh, let let, him, let me know. Okay, so the first question uh, is from Vinay, uh, and it is, where does Python and R stand against each other when it comes to real-time work? Uh, uh, thanks, Vinay, for the question. Uh, uh, I'm in the R group, so don't learn Python. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. To be honest, you know, they are, uh, they are both equally good. Uh, you know, some people argue that uh, you know, Python is better. Uh, you don't have you know, compulsory evidence on one versus the other. It's more of a personal choice. Um, uh, so uh, I would recommend you to choose one or the other. That way, you can learn a lot more in, in one particular area. Um, I would be wrong if I claim that you know R is like, superior to Python. But I found this data, you know, pipeline method of programming to be much more uh, easier to understand and be, uh, compared to R. That's what I found. Um, and that's what I'm going to teach in this particular course. Uh, but Python is, is 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 pretty good as well. So, There's two 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 uh, you know. Uh, two groups, if you will, in, in the data analysis world, among several others too. You know, there's MATLAB, there's Jump, there's Excel, there's so Tableau, lots of other uh, you know tools to learn these kinds of data analysis and programming. Uh, but 